Gauche. Droit. Centre. Canal LFE. Arrière gauche. Arrière droit. of the oceans into the pattern we know today. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution and adaptation have resulted in the creation of countless species that interact to form the largest ecosystem on the planet. Deep in the ocean blue, every species has a role, its own specific function in the delicate balance among all species. From time immemorial, mankind has fished for survival. The never-ending challenge is how to share the sea's resources with other species that depend on them. Increasingly sophisticated commercial fishing practices using advanced technologies have in the last 50 years dramatically improved marine harvesting. We keep going farther and deeper and catching more and more fish. But we seem to have reached the limit. The ocean's ability to meet human nutritional needs is being exhausted, a result of decades of overfishing and abuse. Scientists consider that if nothing is done rapidly to correct the situation, we will see the collapse of commercial fishing within the next few decades. Yet over a billion people depend directly on the sea for survival. The future of many societies may well hinge on whatever conservation measures we are prepared to introduce over the next years.
As part of its mission, 1,000 Days for the Planet, the oceanographic scooter Setna 4 set sail for Indonesia, a country of more than 17,000 islands, where many villages depend on fishing for their food and livelihood. Chief of Mission, Jean Lemire. We're heading to Bali, an exotic island surrounded by coral reefs, known for its remarkable marine biodiversity. Located in the heart of what we call the Coral Triangle, the islands of Indonesia harbor 76% of all species of coral. These reefs provide shelter and food to 37% of all the coral-dwelling fish on Earth. This amazing variety of species has led to a thriving commerce in aquarium fish. It's a lucrative business valued at around $1 billion annually, all categories combined. Of the 40 countries that export tropical fish, Indonesia and the Philippines supply at least 85% of ocean fish to the world's aquariums. The market for tropical fish skyrocketed after the animated film Finding Nemo hit the screen in 2003. An estimated 30 million fish and marine creatures are harvested every year on the planet's coral reefs. There are no regulations about which species can be caught. The strong demand for aquarium fish has led to the widespread use of a destructive fishing technique, cyanide fishing. A solution of sodium cyanide stuns the fish, making them much easier to catch. This technique rapidly degrades the coral reefs. An estimated one square meter of coral is destroyed for every fish caught. Cyanide blocks photosynthesis in the algae that live symbiotically with the corals, depriving them of their main source of food. Cyanide, even in minute quantities, kills the polyps leading to the death and the bleaching of the corals. The practice began in the Philippines in the 1960s and spread rapidly. It's hard to calculate exactly how much cyanide is being used. Scientists estimate that over one million kilograms of sodium cyanide is spread on coral reefs every year. Cyanide fishing is against the law in a number of countries, but enforcement is haphazard at best. If you are a fisherman, you cannot use all kind of techniques because there are regulations. But if you're out in the sea, and Indonesia is so vast, nobody is watching you. So in practice, they do what they like with the techniques, yes. The deadly mixture for corals is obtained by simply dissolving sodium cyanide crystals in seawater. A fisherman has agreed to talk to us anonymously. What is the effect of cyanide? Cyanide stuns the fish. It makes them a little bit dizzy, so they're easier to catch. When you release the cyanide, the coral reacts by spurting out a liquid. Two days later, the coral has turned black all over, like it had been burned. Why do you uh, use uh, this on coral reef? Because with this method, all the fish crowd together, and all we have to do is gather them up. Back in 2000, I made $10 a day for four hours' work. Today, I make quite a bit more. I'd say I make around $30. Is there any risk for your health? Yes. If you breathe in the cyanide, it's very bad for your heart and lungs. 
international pressure has forced local authorities to take some action. But these few police interventions are the exception and often end without official sanction. Illegal fishermen have to receive three official warnings before being arrested. Arrests are rare and do nothing to discourage the practice. Did you get cut before? Yeah, I got caught once. I was convicted of illegal fishing. I went to jail for six months and I had to pay a fine of $50. Indonesian fishermen also use this technique to catch fish intended for human consumption. Increasingly popular in Asia, the fish will be transported live to restaurants around the world, displayed in tanks, and served at premium prices. Fish that survive will metabolize part of the poison, but an estimated 80% of fish caught this way die from cyanide poisoning. The fish that stay alive, that are caught with cyanide, and they actually make it to the consumer markets, you know, there's not so much known about the effect of eating that. But many fish that are caught with cyanide die, and those fish are still sold, and they end up at the local market. So you can imagine that the local communities who eat that fish, because it's dead and they don't waste it, they actually probably have a lot of risk of taking a lot of cyanide that's still in the fish. That's what it died from, and they, they build that up in their body, but it can't be good for people. Another illegal fishing technique is devastating coral reefs. Blast fishing. This technique is fatal. It kills the fish and utterly destroys the structure of the reef. People use bombs to throw at big schools of fish and then they can just scoop up the fish out of the ocean. It's a very easy way to catch a lot of fish in not so much time. You just explode a small bottle. They usually use uh, you know, soft drink bottles. And if it's very close to the coral reef, you have a crater of about a meter. It's devastating. This fish, when it gets to the markets, is damaged. So this goes to the domestic market. This is eaten locally. This explosive is made from fertilizer, according to a recipe that has been handed down through generations. Is there lots of people around here who use uh, the blast fishing? Uh, Not as many as before, but some of us still do. Mm. Why do you use uh, blast fishing? It's easier to feed my family. This way I can harvest a lot of fish in a short amount of time. But now you understand the, all the damages that, uh, that uh, it will make to the coral reef. Yes, I know. It destroys everything. The reef and the fish. It's hard for the resource to recover. There are laws on the books banning all forms of illegal fishing. But in a huge country like Indonesia, enforcement is often sorely lacking. Fortunately, some people have decided to break the cycle of destruction. In the small village of Les on Bali, Made Partiana catches aquarium fish. Like the other fishermen in the village, Made used cyanide fishing for many years. When I was young, in the early 80s, the coral was brightly colored and healthy. 
berkembang But in the early 90s, itu, nelayan di sini the reef started to die. Sampai dua ratusan lebih untuk nelayan ikan hias. Dan daerah tangkap They mereka bukan hanya di perairan Bali, gray. tapi juga ke luar Bali. Dampak daripada portasi itu sendiri Money yang saya lihat was a true dari tahun 80-an itu saya lihat ya mungkin saya belum the fish had no more quarrel to shelter in kondisi karang pada saat itu of. cenderung lebih baik dampak lainnya juga secara ekonomi juga ya karena uh, keberadaan sumber dayanya ikannya kemudian kalau kita umpamakan rumah itu rumah yang sudah hancur kemudian ikan-ikannya juga berkurang dan pendapatan nelayan juga uh, cenderung relatif turun gitu tidak ketimbang uh, tahun-tahun sebelumnya yang terjadi sini ya masyarakat dalam kondisi kebingungan ya, pertama, karena alternatif lain tidak ada dari pemerintah sendiri juga ketika hanya memberikan pelarangan jangan menggunakan potasi jangan menangkap ikan dengan cara merusak tapi uh, belum ada alternatif yang bisa diberikan hanya sekedar pelarangan saja dan masyarakat semakin bingung Bersyukur pada tahun 2000 ada penjajakan situation yang dari NGO lokal a solution. dan They were very tahun 2001 mereka uh, bareng-bareng belajar bersama-sama di sini untuk Mada uses a long net that he sets out above the reef. He selects and collects the most beautiful specimens of all the fish in the net. Mada holds his breath to a depth of between 4 and 10 meters. It's exhausting work, but he prefers this selective, sustainable approach that does not damage the reefs. What we are told that they, they already fish for ornamental fish since 80s. Now in that years, the early years, they're using the net, the mosquito nets. And then their exporter came to Les, and they the one who introduced cyanide. Cyanide was brought to Indonesia by the Philippine uh, uh, fishers, yeah, to collect the high value fish. So from say you know mid 80s until until late you know like 90s in the almost 2000s, cyanide is being used. So this is one dive. Satu kali nyelam ya? Yes. Just wow. one. Berapa lama lu tadi? Dari Since jam 8 eight. sampai kira-kira jam 2. Clock, so now I've been oh, working okay. for six hours. What's the next step now? Langkah selanjutnya apa lima di? Yes, I will sort them out and put them in plastic bags with a little added oxygen. oxygen. Then I take them to my buyer. You want to go with him to the middleman? Yeah. Sure. Boleh ikut ke pengepul? Iya. Yeah, Oke. Okay. Yeah, I'll get it all ready and we'll go. Nanti kita bisa bersama-sama. Oke. Okay. 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 Pakai apa, Pak? Oke, okay, plastik. Made has to carry his catch safely to the buyer, who will check the quality of his fish. Oxygen stored in the inner tube is transferred to plastic bags to keep the fish healthy during transport. Over time, this exceptional fisherman has been able to create a real demand for his high quality fish caught in a net.
village fishermen use boats and the most rudimentary of breathing aids. Their gear consists of a small compressor, a bit of tubing, and for a lucky few, a pressure regulator. Thus equipped, fishers can descend to depths of up to 40 meters. Diving is risky under any circumstances, even more so with inadequate equipment and little or no training. The compressor helps me dive deeper. I get a much better harvest that way. I've been careless and made some serious mistakes. Once, before I knew any better, I swam all the way to the surface without stopping halfway up. I had to be rushed to Dantasa and put in a hyperbaric chamber. A few years ago, some friends and I got the idea of sinking some old tires down to the seafloor as a shelter for the fish. I've only got one site today, but if I set up two sites, I could earn $40. I catch different types of fish depending on demand. The idea of making structures to replace the damaged coral is spreading. With the help of an NGO, the fishermen of Les have begun making concrete structures to replace the coral reefs destroyed by years of cyanide fishing. They have also started a program to reintroduce coral by transplant. Under this flourishing initiative, the coral ecosystem is gradually being reborn. The efforts of these reformed fishermen are being rewarded by a slow buildup of reef fish populations. Today, the whole community of the fishermen of Les has agreed to a complete ban on cyanide fishing in the region. The village is once again living from the fish harvest, but now it's all legal. Village fishermen bring their catch to Mr. Picasso, the local buyer. He also acts as the middleman who negotiates with international exporters. Every fish is inspected and evaluated to guarantee quality. One damaged fin automatically eliminates a fish from the process. Which one is the, the most precious one? It's around a dollar fifty. That's the price that you know the fishermen. Yeah, will that's have. Yeah. Yes. So what's the price when you know it goes to the uh, to the guy in Dem Dempasa? This is quite a small one. Yeah, I'll pay the local fishermen a dollar fifty for it. At Dempasa, I'll be able to sell it for two dollars. And then from Dempasa, it will go. It will take the plane. It will take the plane to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, and then after Hong Kong, they spread it to the world: U.S., Canada, Europe. You know, and then we have no idea what price could be. But the clownfish is the most popular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think it's about the movie. Yes. Because the of the movie? movie? Yeah. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. So, smacking the price difference among various species. Dan juga ini. The price depends on how rare the type of fish is. Kan tersebut kalau misal keberadaannya banyak. And also how difficult they are to catch. Mudah didapat. Okay. Bisa melihat perubahan di antara sebelum masih pakai potasium masih pakai sana sama setelah kan perbedaan ya apa pak? Sangat sangat ada perubahan. Karena dulu kan now that we stop using cyanide, the dead reefs are coming back to life. Slowly, the varieties of fish we hadn't seen for a long time are gradually returning. Before with cyanide fishing, about five percent of the fish would die. Now the mortality rate is down to 
in one typical day, how much money you will earn? Typically, I earn maybe $7 on a bad day and up to $15 on a good day. It all depends on weather conditions, ocean conditions, especially the height of the waves. Made earns about 10 cents for a clownfish. The most expensive fish can go for up to $2, but they are few and far between. Fishermen naturally search out the most lucrative species, and yet they are often the most endangered. There are no regulations here, nor any scientific monitoring to assess and track the state of marine populations. Mr. Pakasi's fish will travel to Denpasar, the capital. How many fish in this load today? On this trip, I have around 2,000. Usually, I have three times more than that. So, in three or four days, if ocean conditions allow, I'll travel to Denpasar with 6,000 fish. And how many fish will survive the transport? The mortality rate is less than 1%. As a rule, if fish die during transport, it is due to human error. And of course, sometimes, the bags can burst during the trip. Middlemen who buy the fish are in a position to turn things around dramatically. By refusing to buy fish caught using cyanide, they will encourage the kind of sustainable fishing methods needed to ensure the future of coral reef ecosystems. But economic interests often outweigh good intentions. In the lucrative market of exporting fish for human consumption, there is still a lot of work to be done. If you catch fish with cyanide, they're not in a very good condition. You can imagine that if you have to ship them out for so many hours before they reach the market, many of them die. So we've always thought it doesn't even make business sense to use cyanide and, and you know, lose so many of your catch because it's very expensive to transport them. If you look at the uh, percentage of fish that is exported uh, now from Indonesia, uh, where you could say it's probably coming from cyanides, uh, it's still around 40%. That is much less than years ago, when I was just saying five years ago, I think the majority, maybe 80 to 90% came from cyanide fisheries, but it's still a lot. It's impossible to tell with the naked eye whether these live fish were caught using cyanide, but they are still widely available on the market. Cyanide is a powerful toxic compound that binds to hemoglobin, blocking the transport of oxygen. Though it may be difficult to assess its long-term impact on human health, the risk is real. Restaurants are not regulated, and patrons seldom have any idea of how the fish on their plate was caught. In a protected bunker, a food fish exporter who wishes to remain anonymous because of a series of threats has changed his ways. This exporter that we are today is actually a very special person because a couple of years ago he contacted uh, WWF and he said, you know, I'm in this business and I'm seeing that there are many, many practices that are not sustainable and I'm really worried about my business. What can I do? I don't know what to do. The exporters set up a network of fishermen who are restricted to net fishing. Their catch is destined for big city restaurants. Using cyanide is strictly forbidden on pain of expulsion, and participating fishermen get better prices for their fish. The fish, especially groupers, are handled with great care by a team trained to the highest standards. This exporter doesn't buy cyanide fish, he doesn't buy fish that is too small, uh, he doesn't buy fish that, you know, uh, has the eggs, is ready to spawn. So he does everything that he can do. 
I think he is the best example of you know a future where you can have a sustainable business and make money and support all these fishermen in these remote places. However, he's the only one and he's just by himself and there's not enough support by the government to work on the other exporters that actually still have very, very unsustainable practices. The exporter has also designed oxygenated transport boxes so the fish can breathe better during long international trips. He has managed to convince some airline companies to accept these transport boxes equipped with an oxygen cylinder for shipping on cargo planes. This exporter's pioneering initiative doesn't please everyone. He has to operate under high security. Other exporters who use cyanide do not appreciate competition that breaks the mold. But the demand for clean fish is gaining ground, and some restaurants are ready to pay a premium for a product that meets the highest standards. After eight hours in transit, Made's fish finally reached the second middleman. The exporter with an order book brimming with international orders. When the fish come in, usually they come in the morning. We open the bags let them sit in the screening area for four or five hours. After that, we move it to a quarantine system. We keep them over there for a few days to see if there's any problem with disease uh, or broken fins, those kind of things. So after a few days of quarantines, we move them to our regular systems. So this is the place where we do the packing. Okay, now they are doing oxygen of uh, the fish. Uh, after that, they will move over there for, for putting in the box. I suppose that uh, because it's cargo mm -hmm. by plane, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So the quantity of water is important. Oh, exactly, exactly. Because we depends on where they are going and how long the flight gonna takes, we pack differently. The farther they go, we put more water, more oxygen. Okay, if this is going to Asia, it's probably just a few hours flight, then it's less water, smaller bags, of course, smaller bags, less water, less oxygen. So, different place, different way of packing. Yeah, because of course, uh, more water, more kilo, more kilo, more money. Yeah, right? more, more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> this is Pakesi, he's my good supplier, and every week he brings fish to us. Okay. So his fish is uh, all net carp. No uh, any uh, cyanide or any medicines. So we really like his fish and we can see the difference from him and then the other, other supplier. Oh, yeah. And is there a way that you can see if uh, a fisherman use cyanide? It's very difficult when the fish just come in and to, to tell the difference between cyanide carp or net carp. So what we need to do is have a really, really good relationship with our supplier and we know the history of the fish and we can trust this supplier. And this, of course, needs years to, to build this trust. This is Nemo, right? Yes. And this is the new star when Disney will release a new film, Dory, mm -hmm. which is a blue tank, right? Right, that's true. What was the impact of the film Finding Nemo on the business? Oh, that was huge. It was a big help for the, for the business because everyone was looking for, for Nemo's, for, for this clown fish. We think there would be a huge demand for this fish, and we already prepared for it. Hopefully, in two years, they are, they are ready. You know, uh, we have a, a lot of stock for this customer. Aquarium fish, like food fish, are sent to the international airport at Denpasar every day. They then begin their long journey to international importers 
who will ship them to wholesalers around the world, who, in turn, will sell them to retail shops or restaurants. Alors tout ce qu'on so voit ici, c'est des poissons here, qui partent. Alors fish, ça, c'est en direction de Munich. This is going to Munich. Ça, ça c'est to Charles de Gaulle, Gaulle in Paris. And the tout ce qu'on a vu passer tantôt, c'est pour uh, Londres. Londres. Alors, il doit partir Tens des of dizaines et des fish dizaines de milliers de poissons par jour everywhere. qui s'en vont un petit peu partout suppliers. avec les différents fournisseurs. Et c'est clair que Paris est vraiment une des capitales vraiment importantes pour l'exportation de poissons tropicaux. The fish that very common is like a clownfish. Now, clownfish, the increase of the price from the fishermen to the first buyer, the first middleman, they probably only twice more expensive. And then from the middleman to the exporter, they another double price. Now from the exporter to the importer, estimate probably they five times more. Okay. And then from, the, from that on could be like 20 to 25 times. But that's for the fish with a not high value fish. Now for the high value fish like angel or blue tang, that could be like a hundred times. That is really amazing. At every stage, the price shoots up. Made, the fisherman from Les, received only 10 cents for his clownfish. The market is expanding exponentially, putting more and more pressure on fish populations. Fish farming could help to meet the skyrocketing demand for both aquarium fish and food fish. Balinese entrepreneur, Mr. Chu, has an extensive operation. This reproductive center for exotic fish is one of the few to successfully breed some species of fish in tanks. Ini kita taruh angel di sini. Eh. Angel fish. Yeah, yeah. And he can breed them. Oben ya kami sudah ada empat jenis sudah bisa sukses. Eh. Yeah, he, he's breeding. It's like four four species now. Ja, jadi this kita is turun lebih banyak ya untuk ikan makan. I'm here every day looking after things. Ini, Mr. Chu has even been able to create his own variety of clownfish. Their distinctive markings make them even more valuable on the market. How many clownfish did he send around the world in the last year? Around one million. So what will happen uh, when they're going to release the, the new Disney film, Dory? These fish are very difficult to reproduce. So if I succeed, I'll be a millionaire for sure. Okay, yeah. I hope we'll be able to meet the demand with farmed fish and leave the rest in the ocean. He really emphasized that if it happened, I mean, like, just took it from the breeding, not from the ocean. You know, it's more healthy, more, more beautiful. So good for nature and good for business. Thank you. <laughs> so what do we have here? This is Napoleon. Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon. Yeah. Okay, bisa. Napoleon fish numbers have dropped by 50% over the last 30 years because of strong demand on the food fish market. Despite an export ban, Napoleon fish are still on the menu in fine restaurants in China and Hong Kong. Unconcerned by their protected status, your chef will prepare a Napoleon the way you like it for the tidy sum of 250 to 300 US dollars a kilo. When did he start uh, this program with Napoleon? Uh, kapan Bapak, apa namanya, memulai program dengan Napoleon ini? 
ini pertama ini proyek dari pemerintah pemerintah program, sekitar empat tahun yang turu permintaan proyek yang ini ikan baru pindah ke sini. Terus tadi jadi kita tidak boleh tanpa tidak boleh tidak boleh tidak boleh semua tidak boleh. Absolutely, that's a very rare fish. It's under the the CITES, so it cannot be exported to other country. And if he's successful breeding it, for science it's going to be a great victory. Yeah. Convincing other fishermen to use sustainable techniques is always complicated. We meet with them and explain things, and they'll agree to start fishing with a net. But after a few days, they go back to their old ways. So now what we do is link up with one local fisherman, who then becomes our ambassador to the other fishermen in the area. But it takes time. Educating people, getting them to really understand, is a long process. So far, we've been able to set up teams in several areas, in different parts of Indonesia. Unfortunately. Nothing is black and white, so the problem is not black and white. You cannot say that these small-scale fishermen are criminals, you know. It's, for them, the amount of money that they make is very, very small. You cannot buy this fish for a good price and, and only pay, I don't know, a few percent of that to the fisherman who's doing all the work and this is all he has. Something has to change in terms of, you know, the value that the fisherman gets. If he gets a little bit more, maybe, you know, he's also more careful with the environment. So it's important to understand who benefits most in this industry. And there's always, I think, a case to make that the fisherman who is responsible should get a fair price. Over a billion people depend directly on fish for survival. It's the most highly sought after source of protein on the planet. And the global population boom will only increase demand for ever more fish. To meet this ever-growing demand, we need to take a cold, hard look at the ways fish are caught to ensure renewal of the resource. Blast fishing and cyanide fishing, already banned by law, must be subject to heightened monitoring in order to halt the disaster now in progress. It is vital that we rethink our methods of harvesting the sea's bounty. Sustainable fishing practices that conserve the fish and their environment must urgently be established if we have any hope of ensuring our food security for the future.